And now the last, uh, it is, it is uh, for the last speaker, Victor Bjork, uh, who will speak about longevity, uh, no, he, who is member of uh, the longevity no deal for deal flow also the Hindu I did I didn't know about that sorry and uh, scientific uh, advisor at healthy longevity guide and also member of the board of uh, uh, Hills. So Victor, the floor is yours for something that I am very curious to listen about it. Circadian uh, uh, aspects are fascinating for me at least. Thank you very much. Can you, thank you. So I'm going to speak about uh, uh, a paper that I wrote uh, uh, for rejuvenation research a couple of years ago. That actually is uh, about uh, the circadian clock and aging, which I consider uh, understudied uh, area, or not necessarily understudied, but uh, underfunded when it comes to translational medicine and the companies. So. So uh, I wrote a paper uh, together with some other HEALS members um, uh, quite a few years ago about uh, uh, classifying biological aging as a disease uh, that got published in the journal Frontier in Genetics. But uh, aging is a very broad concept. So um, my goal here was to, to uh, also introduce the concept of circadian clock aging as a separate disease, something that we would potentially go into WHO and uh, improve the current funding and the goal-oriented research and the biotech business development in the area. So, uh, okay, wait. Yeah, so um, I call it circadian clock neuronal senile atrophy syndrome in the paper, uh, or abbreviated circlonsa syndrome. So uh, my goal here was to really be able to explain what it is, not only in an academic manner, but also propose some solutions that we can work on potentially to improve this area. So I'm going to go through here first a bit about circadian clocks and the uh, aging. So um, circadian clocks are not a new development. They have been around in uh, the tree of life for many hundreds of millions of years. And it's not a concerned gene, but uh, there are many genetics that control it that are different in uh, uh, across uh, the phylogenetic tree of life. And um, it was a Nobel Prize in discovery back in 1984. And it's regulated by many uh, circadian proteins that many of you probably know, like the clock and the reverba and the BMAL and so on. They are very well known. So uh, we all know the famous hallmarks of aging paper. Uh, we know that the, the aging hallmarks also overlap and feedback upon each other, and that circadian rhythms become disorganized with the uh, aging, and it could potentially even uh, be called a separate hallmark, as they included in the new paper of uh, the hallmarks of health, loss of uh, circadian uh, rhythms could be considered uh, loss of health. So uh, we, we know that elderly people sleep less well, and... Um, this is not something that just affects the sleep and the brain, but it affects every cell in the body that has a circadian clock inside them. And uh, it's mainly orchestrated then by the suprachiasmatic nucleus, SCN, in the brain. So, so what is then the, the circadian rhythm really about in the, the suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus? So it's a region in the brain that is above the optic chiasma. So it's controlled by daylight and uh, it's connected also to the pineal gland, which secretes, secretes melatonin. So it's a very, very small region of the brain. It's barely visible. It's a pair of nuclei with about 9,000 neurons. And uh, it uh, controls then the downstreams all the circadian clocks across the whole body in different uh, tissues. And, uh, So the mechanisms of, of the circadian clock is uh, to a large extent known. We know that uh, it, uh, it is disturbed, for example, in the shift uh, workers, but uh, generally it's adapted to our 24-hour rhythm, 12-hour day and 12-hour night, which 
gets disturbed as well in the polar re regions. And uh, so there is this uh, oscillatory amplitude that uh, is very high when you are young, but when you get older, it uh, gets lower and lower. So you can uh, you can uh, clearly see that we, when you measure it on an actinograph that uh, the expression is very, very high, high peaks when you're young and low peaks when you get older, so. So yeah, so what happens with aging that mechanistically causes these problems is a depopulation of neurons. Uh, the population of neurons can go down with half about in uh, aged mice. And there's an alteration as well of neurotransmitters that cause a decline in the youthful uh, amplitudes. Um, and then there's also an alteration of electrophysiological properties of the cells, so like a disturbance of ion channels. So the SCN doesn't really stop with the aging, but the, it, uh, the output becomes disorganized. Um, so uh, it's rather that it becomes the like an orchestra that doesn't sync rather than something that universally slows down. And the, the consequences are, of course, uh, reduced quality of sleep um, and um, an increased risk of cancer, which we know is uh, very, very elevated in uh, shift workers. When uh, people are getting older, they also get cancer. So it's very hard to elucidate to what extent this is a, this would be intrinsically linked to SCN aging. But for certain, uh, we know that the, the cell cycle, the timing of the cell cycle is uh, controlled by the circadian clock as well. So of course the cell might get uh, the wrong signals of uh, when to divide and the divide in a state having not passed the cell cycle properly because of the misaligned circadian output, which might uh, be a unexplored uh, cause of cancer and mediate why shift workers have more cancer, but also why so-called naturally aging people have more cancer. And uh, this accelerates uh, the general aging process across the body, um, of course, and uh, it might even be uh, implied as well in cellular senescence. And you can see here in the young uh, and middle-aged mice that uh, there is like a decline in uh, the biological rhythms when we measure that with the uh, actinograph over the day. And mice are, of course, nocturnal so it's a bit different from humans so so let's talk then about some interventions what we actually can do because that's what ultimately is relevant for us um it has actually been known for a very long time uh, already back in 1998 so 25 years ago almost that uh, one could extend lifespan simply by transplanting neurons to the SCN to in aged hamsters. So it is quite a significant effect. So they take neonatal tissue from hamsters and transplant it into the SCN of aged hamsters, and you can extend the lifespan that way. So clearly, this circadian clock by itself as a single intervention uh, is capable of producing a, a life extension similar to what we see in even a rapamycin. I mean. 9-14% is generally the benchmark for rapamycin in healthy mice. So, uh, and we didn't know uh, have massive evidence that shift workers live shorter and have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and cancer. And uh, there have been many longitudinal studies done as well on humans, like from the um, from uh, early childhood until well into uh, non agenarians so 90 plus people. Uh, and the one has seen that they have a lowered oscillatory amplitude with age. Um, so there's uh, many angles of evidence for why it would uh, actually be an important factor. So there are three approaches then to take to the aiding SCN as I can see it. There's a pharmaceutical approach, a med tech approach, and a repair approach, which would be the ultimate cure. So uh, the pharmaceutical approach is obviously already something that is uh, to, uh, to a small degree at least being pursued. Uh, and the goal here there is to develop drugs that increase the circadian output and oscillatory amplitudes. So a bit like a um, amplify the signals, a bit like a hearing aid, just like uh, the hearing goes down with age, you can amplify it so it goes up. But of course, um, in theory at least, when you get extremely old, that wouldn't work anymore because there's so little signals to amplify. So you would, uh, end up with sleeping problems and uh, oscillatory disregulation anyway, but you can perhaps compensate it for a while. And we, of course, know that uh, this, the melatonin hormone 
uh, it improves sleep and it uh, might be a good addition for many elderly as well to take it. And the uh, NAD boosters con uh, control the circadian clocks as well. So that could be a potential intervention. And there are several lab chemicals, uh, for example, the uh, long day sin and the uh, reverba, uh, which is a central uh, protein that controls the circadian clock. The uh, reverba agonist, uh, SR 9009 and 11, um, and CLK8. And it should be noted also that the um, SR 9009 compounds, uh, they are, are quite used by bodybuilders um, illegally, of course, since it's a lab chemical and not a Something that has undergone clinical testing in humans for a particular disease condition. And uh, I am actually not sure why that is the case. And uh, since there's a dysfunction of ion channels that controls calcium influx inside the SCN with aging in the neurons, the, there's potentially a lot of opportunity as well in pharma to improve the function there if you can develop a drug that crosses the blood brain barrier for that. And there are Quite a few academic research groups that are working on, on uh, this. Um, not that, that many, but a few. Uh, and there's a company as well in Oxford called the uh, uh, Circadian Therapeutics. And uh, as far as I know, they, that's the pharmaceutical approach that is currently taken. So I will go into more radical things here in the next slide. And that will be the medtech approach. Uh, you could potentially replace and enhance the SCN with a hormonal uh, pump that would then control all the circadian um, hormones that get disregulated with age. And that you could have a, set up a, like a miniaturized neural drug delivery system that has been actually explored for Parkinson with a carbidopa, levidopa pump that you can implant into the brain. Of course, this is a very, very complicated thing with many risks is it will involve neurosurgery. And uh, you might not want to do neurosurgery uh, unless there's like a really serious cause like a brain tumor or something. Um, but um, this is uh, as well an opportunity to do. And the most um, targeted intervention that would be to go after the root cause, uh, the repair approach. So uh, used induced pluripotent stem cells transplant, and they could be either patient derived or uh, grown in the lab, and or, or potentially rescue the cells. For example, dissolve uh, neuronal lipofuscin that uh, that accumulates with age and might contribute to to the decline in neural function in the SM. So let's see here. And then um, one will need to set up um, the benchmarks of tests to test this intervention. One will uh, be able to anticipate an improvement in uh, uh, REM sleep, the deep sleep that uh, declines with elderly. And uh, actually elderly don't, I mean, they both sleep shorter, but they also have a much lower quality of sleep. And you can see that as well in the reduced oscillatory amplitudes that they have. Um, and uh, you would expect a reduction in inflammaging. Um, inflammaging is increased in shift workers as well. Uh, so it, uh, and it increases with age. So um, any normalization of oscillatory rhythms across the body should be regulating this back to more youthful levels. And as well, an increase in mitochondrial count. Um, for example, some drugs that affect uh, uh, the circadian clock also increase mitochondrial biogenesis in the body. Um, and uh, one could potentially uh, also anticipate an increase in physiological function and sarcopenia um, because um, mice that uh, have disturbances in their circadian clock, severe disturbances by uh, dysfunction of the BMAL gene, for example, they, they suffer from frailty and sarcopenia. So it might be a contributing factor as well that is less studied. So this is a really a business opportunity. To my knowledge, there's no company that currently exists that aims to selectively repair the SCM by targeting the specific um, root causes, despite multiple academic uh, um, research group. And, uh, I cannot, uh, that's something to discuss afterwards what actually the bottlenecks would be, because I am not uh, sure why it's, this is not a bigger topic in that sense. So I, since uh, we are, this is the final talk, I would just like to tell everybody to sleep well as well. Uh, it's getting quite late and with an improved SCN, you could sleep even better. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Victor. Yes, indeed, uh, <laughs> it was a good uh, word at the end, uh, but still we have uh, time for a few uh, questions. Uh, 
So uh, we have uh, we have actually a discussion online about uh, about what you said at the beginning. No, so, so not related to uh, sleep, but related to uh, aging as a disease or not. There are long discussions about it. But okay, maybe you can uh, give a brief comment after reading the 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 dialogue there but i would also ask uh, now if there are people here uh, who have let's say questions about circadian uh, rhythm and uh, aging it will it would be uh, also of course interesting yeah is it possible and if to there, ask? yes go ahead yeah, but, yeah, sure, uh, sure. i don't go know ahead. how to raise hands here <laughs> So a uh, great presentation. So what could be done today to prevent uh, aging or, or maybe uh, remove aging uh, of this thing in the heart? Well, um, the thing that one could do are simple interventions like practicing sleep hygiene and giving melatonin for uh, possible as a sleep uh, uh, normalizer. Uh, and that would work to some extent, but uh, of course, uh, and this is, of course, not something I, I absolutely don't uh, advocate. But in uh, in a theory, one could take the drugs that are currently exist in uh, as uh, uh, lab chemicals that have plenty of uh, mouse data on them, and they do proper clinical trials as well to evaluate them in uh, in uh, humans to to see. So the pharmaceutical approach is certainly there, and uh, there are a few companies working on it. But uh, there's a limited amount of things one can do apart from. Um, being extra cautious about proper sleep hygiene and perhaps use artificial sun lamps as well um, if one live on northerly latitudes. So that's. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Daya. Thank you, uh, Victor. Maybe Can I have, I? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you had time already to to read the, and to make a comment. So, so somebody wants to ask a, a question. Go. I, I want to ask. Uh, uh, thank you, Didier. Thank you, Victor. I want to ask actually, why do you think there is so little work in this direction? Because the connection is so obvious. I mean, uh, sleep is probably the only regenerative medicine that is actually working. Why people aren't investing a lot of um, resources into this particular connection, this particular direction? Yeah, that I mean that uh, that is a hard question to answer short. Uh, give a brief answer, but uh, um, certainly, I mean, I mean some areas are simply unexplored. Um, people are not aware, uh, and there is also the the indication problem because it's uh, sleeping issues is an annoyance, but it's not a, a direct uh, disease like uh, cancer that uh, that uh, one thinks about, uh, but a more generalized aging problem that is uh, seen as. Uh, perhaps less of a disease and that's something that needs to change. But then of course the important thing here is to really put the issue on the on the SCN, the, the aging of the SCN as a contributor to that. So, and advocate for it. Any more questions? Okay, so, um... Yeah, can you can you comment about aging as a disease? Uh, just short. Uh, yeah, you know the the old question. So um, Walter is saying, uh, okay. So the old question is: Is this a good uh, thing because everybody is aging and because it's kind of uh, um, people will perceive this as an insult and uh, because uh, we are aging since we uh, are born and so on. Uh, on, or is this uh, still a good thing to say aging as a disease? Or uh, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, saying that aging is a disease is a good thing uh, because it uh, would uh, enable people to be more focused uh, on it. But I know it's a very diverse uh, range of uh, opinions there. Uh, but I certainly think that uh, having the the SCN uh, aging classified as a disease in itself would help. Uh, uh, a lot and as well if we if, for example just the, simply the presence of senescent cell in the body was also uh, classified as a disease like call it hypersenocytosis or whatever that makes uh, a particular aging hallmark more uh, amenable for for intervention that will strongly help the cost rather than 
being too vague about what it is, because having too many system cells or a dysfunctional SCN, that's certainly more concrete and uh, possible to narrow down than the general feeling. So. Uh, thank you, uh, Victor.